I'll be going and talking about uh, real estate and easements and takings briefly. Um, another way to describe this is I'm the cover band for Bill. Um, the um, section on um, real estate contracts, common interest developments, they are in your materials. Um, we're not going to cover um, those items, but there's a number of cases from last year that are included in that. I want to sort of jump right into the easement portion. In fact, why don't we talk about this um, Romero case uh, briefly. That's item one on page 138. Um, let's look at this photograph right here. In 1940s, these two parcels were actually bought by a couple. They were all bare land. And then in 1985, the son of the owners, they built a house on the property on the right side, okay? There was bare land on the left. The city of Sierra Madre allowed the home construction subject to a boundary line adjustment to move the boundary to the left to accommodate that driveway for reasons that are not even clear in the record and the court doesn't understand why the boundary line adjustment in 1985 was never completed. Yeah, you guessed it. Legal boundary remained the same over the years. The parties, however, acted like it was, and the building permits, nevertheless, were issued by the city, and a driveway and concrete wall was built dividing those two properties. Then, of course, both properties were conveyed to a number of other different buyers, and actually, for several, oh, for three decades, they were continued to be transferred with the original description of the property line. Um, <clears throat> The entire time, the concrete wall way there in the back of that photograph and the driveway and planter box that you see there in the middle and the front encroached over the property line by over eight feet. Uh, that yellow tape measure is in that picture. And of course, it's always the new buyers that come in that finally realize something has happened. Um, usually it's a dispute with the new buyer and old neighbor and they start getting their surveyors and they find out that there's a problem and um, the uh, property owner on the left sued to have all those encroachments removed and move it all the way back over a new wall on that yellow strip right there, which is the actual property line. Um, the trial court actually resolved the dispute by granting the property owner there on the right an exclusive implied easement for those encroachments. We'll talk about that in a minute. And alternatively, the trial court said, well, we're going to give you an equitable easement in favor of that property owner on the right to maintain that entire 1,300 square foot encroachment. However, the property owner on the left would then be entitled to compensation for the value of the loss of $69,000. Actually, in the case, it, quote, it's described as a battle of expert witnesses ensued regarding the actual valuation of that. In fact, one of the guy on the left said, you don't need that property, the expert is, because then the driveway itself, you can see here, was actually then limited down to 7.2 feet if they got their way. And he said, well, you can drive a Prius and open up the door still, so you don't need it for the 32 feet. And the court said, no, we're going to give you those two. The Court of Appeal, however, overruled the judgment on the exclusive implied easement because this is a whole new issue of law, never been decided before. They said, no, you can't have an implied exclusive easement. Exclusive basically means that it divests the owners on the less of nearly all rights that they customarily have in residential property, including access and practical usage. It was a granted review by the Supreme Court, this case, and the Supreme Court said, no, actually you can potentially have an exclusive implied easement and under the facts in this case. However, they remanded it back down to see whether the requirements for an implied easement had been met here. So that's kind of a new issue of law. I want to go on to um, uh, the takings and exactions. And um, this is the Sheets case. Um, and um, I speak here carefully because on the far left, we are counsel of record that was in the United States Supreme Court in January hearing this case. And so I have to be very careful about what I say. Let's put it this way. I won't have a whole lot of comments about it other than what's in the public record because we are not only counsel of record, but the litigation is ongoing. And um, the county of El Dorado, our client of Abbott and Kinderman, 
imposed a traffic mitigation impact fee or a TIM fee as a condition of issuing a property owner, George Sheets, a building permit for the construction of a single family residence on his property in Placerville, California. Mr. Sheets filed an action challenging the fee on various grounds. He alleged that the TIM fee is invalid under California's Mitigation Fee Act. And he alleged that the TIM fee was invalid under the takings clause of the United States Constitution, specifically the special application of the unconstitutional conditions doctrine in the cases of Nolan versus California Coastal Commission in 1987 and Dolan versus City of Tigard in 1994. The Superior Court in El Dorado County rejected both of his claims. The California Court of Appeal that we argued at affirmed and the California Supreme Court denied review. As to the Mitigation Fee Act, the Court of Appeal here in, Cal in Sacramento held that the county satisfied the requirements for a legislative enactment of a TIM fee under Government Code 6601A. As to the takings claim, the trial court and the Court of Appeal held that the heightened scrutiny under Nolan Dolan did not apply. Under rulings by the Supreme Court of California going back a number of decades, the Court of Appeal held that the heightened scrutiny of Nolan Dolan does not apply to legislatively mandated development impact fees that, as here, generally apply to a broad class of permit applicants. Therefore, the Court of Appeal held that the um, Nolan Dolan didn't apply, but instead the reasonable relationship test in the Mitigation Fee Act and the California Constitution did apply, and the county had satisfied that test. Now, after the California Supreme Court denied review in our case, the U.S. Supreme Court granted cert to resolve the issue of legislative and, and um, exactions that he had had sat on for a number of decades. And in, on September 23rd, 2023, they granted um, cert to review the question of whether Nolan Dolan heightened scrutiny applies to a legislative exaction of general applicability. You know, I was able to attend the oral argument in the Supreme Court on January 9th. And both sides appeared to agree that strict scrutiny under Nolan Dolan could theoretically apply to a legislative inaction or exaction. But beyond that, there was no consensus between the parties and, frankly, the justices either. When the case was submitted, there remains, and it's now under submission still, we're waiting for a decision that would come by the end of the term at the end of June of this year, there's actually fundamental disagreement as to two huge issues. First, at oral argument, Justice Kagan asked from the bench, quote, is there a taking at all? Chief Justice Roberts stated, quote, in all other taking cases, there was an identifiable property interest that was at issue. Here, the just, uh, Chief Justice said, the county is, quote, not taking any particular property interest. They're not taking any part of the land. They're not taking an easement. It's just use to which the land is being put. I don't think there's another case under Nolan Dolan and Kuntz where what's involved is simply value as opposed to a concrete identifiable property interest. Justice Jackson explained, quote, I think we can say that since it's the kind of dedicated property appropriation that occurs, I'm sorry, I think we can say that since it isn't the kind of dedicated property appropriation that occurs in Nolan, Dolan, and Kuntz, it's not a taking. So this particular formula, the Nolan, Dolan test, doesn't apply. Then Justice Kagan added, if this is just something like a tax, unconstitutional conditions analysis never comes into play. Now there's a second key issue in this case that's now pending. As Justice Kagan said, quote, even if you assume that there has been some kind of taking here and that unconstitutional analysis does come into play, the Nolan Dolan analysis might look very different from what Nolan Dolan analysis looks like just because Nolan and Dolan were focused on individual parcels, individual property owners. And this is a general scheme and it would be very difficult to apply Nolan and Dolan analysis literally to a general scheme so that there might be ways in which Nolan Dolan analysis becomes something that, you know, really looks different in application. Justice Kavanaugh cited the amicus brief joined by 18 states and the District of Columbia on behalf of the County of El Dorado and stated this, quote, the amicus briefs of the states and of the American Planning Association, for example, say in essence, paraphrasing, it would be a total disaster to try to do that Nolan Dolan analysis 
on a parcel specific basis and would really destroy the concept of imposing impact fees for new development. As Justice Kagan asked Mr. Sheets's counsel in the context of a general applicable scheme, instead of doing a parcel based Nolan Dolan analysis, quote, why wouldn't we ask more generally about the proportionality or reasonableness of what, uh, or whatever word you want to use of the general legislative scheme, end quote. And after listening to Mr. Sheets' counsel, Justice Kagan said, quote, and I think you have just suggested, no, you wouldn't really have to do it piece by piece as long as you had the right categories. But I think I'm gonna suggest that this scheme by the County of El Dorado is highly reticulated. Justice Kavanaugh asked, how reticulated does the formula have to be? How reticulated? Because Justice Kagan said, this one's very reticulated. I agree with that. Now, the oral argument, after oral argument, the commentator at SCOTUS blog said this later that day, quote, there was a variety of open questions after nearly 90 minutes of debate. So a decision is by the end of June, we'll see what happens. Um, I think I'm gonna pass at that point and give it to the main event here and turn it over to both Bill and Gage who will deal with the <clears throat> California Environmental Quality Act and land use 